Daily Tech News Show is made possible by its listeners. Thanks to all of you, including Nam Fazikas, Chris Allen, and Chris Smith. Coming up on DTNS, David Spark from CISO Series helps us understand the cybersecurity hiring disconnect, plus the main announcements from Microsoft Build, and we have two more contenders for useful NFTs. Will we judge them worthy? This is the Daily Tech News for Tuesday, May 24th, 2022 in Los Angeles. I'm Tom Merritt. And from Studio Redwood, I'm Sarah Lane. And I'm Roger Chang, the show's producer. Co-host and producer at the CISO series, David Spark. Welcome back to the show. I am thrilled to be back. We are thrilled to have you. Uh, Let's start right here with a few tech things you should know. CNBC's and the Wall Street Journal's sources both say that Airbnb will close its domestic business in China, which only accounts for about 1% of Airbnb's overall revenue. Apps like Meituan, which combine food delivery and travel, kind of a super app, and more, dominate the Chinese market. And those can bring in new customers without spending as much as Airbnb. Plus, rigid COVID-19 lockdowns have put a strain on Airbnb's business in the region as well. Chinese travelers will still be able to book Airbnb properties overseas. Washington, D.C.'s attorney general has filed a lawsuit against Meta CEO Mark Zuckerberg, accusing him of personal responsibility in the improper sharing of Facebook customer data with Cambridge Analytica in 2016. Uh, University of Cambridge data scientist Alexander Kogan, if you recall, had collected data from users for an academic use, then improperly shared data of those respondents' friends with Cambridge Analytica which then used the data to help political campaigns, including the unsuccessful presidential campaign of Senator Ted Cruz. Facebook was fined $5 billion for that incident in 2019 because it did not take enough precautions to stop that type of improper sharing from being possible. The D.C. case alleges that Zuckerberg was personally aware of the risks and chose to ignore them. Walmart is expanding its drone delivery service in partnership with DroneUp to 34 sites across six states with a rollout planned for the end of the year. Walmart announced its investment in DroneUp last year, late last year, after it trialed deliveries of COVID-19 testing kits in Bentonville, Arkansas. So between the hours of 8 a.m. and 8 p.m. for customers in covered markets going forward, the drones can move up to 10 pounds of merchandise, so not Really heavy stuff, but, you know, you need some Tylenol and maybe a sandwich. They're remotely controlled by FAA certified pilots, so they're not fully autonomous. But when the drone reaches a customer's yard, it lowers the package on a cable. You guessed my lunch, Tylenol and a sandwich. (laughs) Um, Walmart doing what Amazon said they would do but haven't yet. Clearview AI has revised its facial recognition product with a new plan to sell it to private companies. And you may think, well, aren't they prohibited from doing that? Yes, they agreed not to sell their product, their old product to private companies. But this new product actually gets a person's permission before obtaining their image uh, and then matching them to photo IDs and other data. One example, for instance, is Columbia's Vale, a buy now, pay later app. In order to get loans, which is what buy now, pay later is, and then access your account, users must upload a copy of their ID in the first place. That's voluntary. You want to use the service, you upload a copy of your ID. And then when you access the service later, you can take a selfie and they'll use Clearview AI to match your selfie to your own ID with your permission. Vale requires this kind of identification to prevent fraud, and it will be switching from Amazon's recognition system to the new Clearview AI system. Whether it's at Computex or not, we have lots of hardware announcements spilling out. So here's a roundup of some stuff that caught our eye. Logitech's $99 MX Master 3S mouse. It's quiet and it works on glass with its 8,000 DPI optical sensor. Logitech also has a $170 MX mechanical keyboard and 150 mini version of the same keyboard. These are basically gaming keyboards for work use. Asus announced a 500 hertz NVIDIA G-Sync monitor called the ROG Swift 500 hertz. No price or release date on that one. On Weibo, Motorola teased a phone with a 200 megapixel camera coming to China next month. And HP announced a mid-range pavilion laptop with an option for an OLED screen, as well as a pavilion X360 14 laptop starting at $600, so pretty affordable, with an option for built-in 5G. All right, uh, let's talk a little about what's going on at Microsoft Build. Let's do it. Neural engines and other AI-focused chips are common in phones, 
we're getting more common in laptops as well. Microsoft announced a couple of ways to support developers who want to use these kinds of chips. Microsoft particularly wants developers to move off of ARM64 emulation and build cloud-native AI applications. Yeah, it's a chicken and egg thing. Uh, so they're giving you hardware. Well, they're not giving you hardware, but they announced hardware. Project Volterra is a device that runs on Qualcomm's Snapdragon platform and lets developers explore AI scenarios, machine learning stuff mostly, uh, using the Snapdragon neural processing engine. The device will let developers build and test ARM native apps alongside tools that include Visual Studio, VS Code, Microsoft Office, and Teams. It's a flat box form factor, kind of like a Mac Mini. Uh, it can be stacked on your desk or in server racks, and it is coming later this year. Uh, also alongside this, Windows itself is getting a neural processing SDK toolkit so you can execute, debug, and analyze performance of your deep neural networks if you're using a Snapdragon chip, and a preview of a native ARM64 version of Visual Studio 22. Native, not emulated, is coming in the next few weeks and is expected to fully ship later this year along with ARM64.net support. Now, now granted, uh, neither Sarah uh, nor me or, or even even David are, are enterprise developers, uh, so if, if there's something in here that gets you excited, uh, email us feedback at dailytechnewsshow.com. We'd love to hear that. Uh, I think it is significant that you're seeing Microsoft move so much more into ARM where they're saying we need to encourage the developers to build for ARM, right? Uh, certainly, that's what Microsoft <laughs> wants developers to do. I, I would certainly want to hear from any developer who says, I'm not super pumped about this, because this was a pretty big story this morning. Uh, and I think it in uh, overall, it, it seems like Somewhat of a shift, uh, particularly for what um, what what these chips, native uh, AI chips, are capable of. Yeah, doing. it's a, it's indicative of the growing importance of ARM platforms uh, to Windows. I had somebody on my Substack go, "Was this mean Microsoft gets off Intel the way Apple did?" I'm like, eh, "It's not exactly the same thing because uh, Microsoft doesn't build it. You know, it doesn't tie its operating system the way Apple does." Go ahead, David. But isn't this just kind of the for any kind of platform? which needs developers like a gaming platform or anything like that. There always needs to be this announcement to try to drive everyone to get the developer kits to start building. And, uh, you know, it's, I don't know how much they do testing with the developer community to see how they're going to uh, feedback it, but I got to assume they do a considerable amount because they don't want it to fall flat on its face. Yeah, I think what they've they found is they've done partnerships to encourage development on ARM with Qualcomm before, and everybody just did emulation because they could. They're like, well, why, why would I do the work if I don't have to? So this is an attempt to try to nudge them over and be like, come on, native applications. Here, we'll give you Visual Studio. Well, Sarah, uh, any other hardware out there? Uh, Project Volterra isn't the only hardware for devs that Microsoft announced. Tom, you are correct. Microsoft DevBox lets you access a pre-configured developer workstation in Microsoft 365, working on any browser and supporting any IDEs and SDKs that run on Windows. A portal lets you add and remove boxes and parallelize tasks uh, across multiple machines. Dev boxes kick off in private preview now, with public preview coming in the next few months. Microsoft's low code power platform added Power Pages and also Power Apps Express Design. Power Pages makes it easy to build a modern secure website and also integrates with Visual Studio Code, Azure DevOps, and GitHub if you need it. Yeah. So these are just, these are non-ARM specific. In fact, they're very cloud uh, oriented in, in the case of the Microsoft dev box, uh, but just good stuff there. On the broader Windows side of things, Microsoft removed the wait list. If you want to add Win32 applications to the Microsoft store, that's good for devs, but it's also good for us users because it means we should start seeing more things show up in the store. And Microsoft will support third-party widgets in Windows 11 later this year uh, for both Win32 apps and PWAs. This comes a few days after after Microsoft started testing more of its own desktop widgets, desktop, in addition to the ones in the widget mm -hmm. panel, so you can actually see them without having to go into the panel. Uh, Power Apps Express Design uh, can take a PDF or image uh, when properly designed in something like Figma and converted into an app with working controls and data storage. That, that goes along with what uh, Sarah was just talking about with the Power Platform there. Uh, but yeah, good. I, I, I don't know if there's too much to say about this, but good, good news that we should be able to see more apps in the App Store and get more widgets. Indeed. It also wouldn't be billed without a Microsoft Teams announcement or 
many of them. <laughs> <laughs> the big one was live share that lets participants co-edit or co-create in apps that integrate with teams. So for example, developers at Hexagon created an app that lets teams users zoom in, annotate, edit 3D models in real time. That's going to be great for some teams. There's also a new whiteboard integration with similar co-editing and creation functions. Yeah. Uh, and uh, any of you use Teams much? I, I, I've used it sporadically. So. I mean, I, 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 I consider it a Slack competitor, but no, I, I, I don't use Teams with, with anybody that I work with. I many Teams meetings, but that's about it. Do you not go because it's in Teams? <laughs> I know I don't refuse to go, especially if it's a sponsor. <laughs> yeah, I, I like this. Uh, it, this is another one where you're going to have to have a lot of people get on board and, and create the integration. But it seems like they've got a good good lineup of people trying it out. So it uh, looks promising. All right. You may think that with cryptocurrency crashing, NFTs are on their way out. But we've been thinking that the best use cases for the technology may not have surfaced yet. So we have two attempts at NFT businesses today to look at. I sort of like the idea. That, that we are now holding court and we are the judges of whether we like these <laughs> ideas or not. Sarah, what do we start with? Well, let's start with eBay. A uh, lot of eBay users out there. eBay's partnered with a company called One Of to mint 13 3D animated renderings of Wayne Gretzky. You may have heard of him. Kind of a cool hockey a player. Great one. <laughs> Making a signature move on the ice. More NFTs will be minted later this year of various athletes that have been featured on the cover of Sports Illustrated. So like the biggest athletes in the world type thing. Prices will start at a very reasonable $10 in the future, although the cheapest Gretzky one was $25. Still pretty affordable if you're, you know, in the NFT world, you know, that they go for quite a bit more. Each NFT will have varying amounts uh, min minted. So for example, the $25 Gretzky had 199 while the one that only had 15 sold for $1,500 each. Oh, so the more there are available, the cheaper they are. Yeah, it supply and demand. It's like physical prints of images as well. Yeah, yeah. That's that's the idea, right? Is you're mimicking that collector's marketplace in, exactly. in digital. Uh, I, I mean, I, listen, I don't spend a lot of time on eBay. I, I certainly use it here and there. Uh, my, you know, one of, I, I believe it's been... Uh, much more in sort of the music NFT space. Uh, so this is a little bit of an expansion for for that company. But this makes a lot of sense, uh, especially because if you're into collectibles, and not everybody is, but if you are, eBay is a place you've probably perused sure. mm -hmm. more than a million times to you know f figure out if you can get that thing that you really want that really matters to you. So this is seems like a pretty natural evolution. I, I agree wholeheartedly because eBay has figured out what is the collectibles marketplace. Also, in terms of the pricing mechanism for it as well, or you know, letting letting the market decide the price as well. So why not add NFTs to it? It does seem pretty logical. Uh, for the for the uh, prosecution, uh, I would say. Only Oilers, Gretzky. No Kings. No Blues. Come on. <laughs> I guess he was never on Sports Illustrated's cover with that, so maybe that's why. It, everything you guys are saying makes sense, and the fact that these sold out in a heartbeat, I think, is the other evidence that. This well, I think the brand of business. eBay and Gretzky helped a lot in that. Yeah, respect. yeah. We'll we'll see. Jury's out. Jury's out on whether this one uh, holds. For the well, future. and when uh, eBay and one of were announcing this partnership. They made a point to say, you know, this is for a lot of folks that just aren't into crypto yet. They're not yeah. necessarily NFT collectors yet. It's an easy but way. Yes, this is where we we'll want to make it as easy as possible and with a, you know, low uh, financial barrier to entry. And well, there, I'd wonder how many people will pick them up on that. But this is a big deal because, and correct me if I'm wrong, where else has NFTs or even crypto entered? an existing well-known marketplace that people already have their uh, payment mechanisms locked in already. Yeah. Like, I mean, this is huge. There are others, but eBay's certainly the biggest one because no, that, the I mean, second there, biggest yeah, retailer like, to Amazon, the, right? The, so the, this is huge. It would be the equivalent of Amazon all of a sudden yeah. doing this. It's, you know? it, exactly. Uh, all right. So we're, we're judging that one a, a, a tentative success, it sounds like. Uh, sure. What about this one? The Wall Street Journal reports that a startup called Pink Tada... Pink Tada? I don't know. I like Pink Tada. Uh, <laughs> has launched a hotel booking system that issues your reservation as an NFT. 
So your reservation is not technically refundable, but you can use that token for other hotels. If you're like, actually, I can't stay at this hotel, you can go to Pinktada and say, I want to I want to transfer this token to another hotel for another reservation, or you can sell it to another traveler. Now, I didn't find for sure whether this is true, but theoretically that could cut the original hotel in on the revenue when you resell it because NFTs can work that way. Uh, Pinktada also said that if you get stuck, they will be the buyer of last resort of your reservation, which implies that you'll never get, get that you can like sell it back to them at some point. Uh, the hotel will get their money either way. So the hotels are motivated to participate in this. Uh, hotels and resorts in the Caribbean, Mexico, San Francisco, and Hawaii are all participating. The Argonaut, uh, where I, I, I spent uh, my, my first night after I got married is, is part of this. You can get an NFT reservation there in San Francisco. So this, this <laughs> confuses me a little bit. Uh, and here's why. So, okay, Pink Tata says... Uh, Sarah books a hotel at the wherever hotel that you stayed at, Tom. And maybe last minute I'm like, eh, you know, I changed my mind or I can't do it. And the hotel doesn't want to have an empty room because I canceled last minute. And Pink Tata says, well, don't worry about it, Sarah. You either transfer it to somebody else, but at the last minute, we'll just buy back this NFT from you. Mm -hmm. So both you and the hotel lose nothing. Why would Pink Tata do that? I, I, like, what what does that I, company I think, gain? I think they're Most counting on the fact that hotel reservations currently. I, I think they're counting on the fact that before. not that many people will do that, uh, and so they want to provide okay. a safety net to get people to try it. Sure. I but that get, doesn't I, seem like a sustainable model. It doesn't. It doesn't seem like something they could keep doing forever, unless people get so used to this that they. You know, they they just cancel in such low numbers that Pink Tata calls that the the cost of insurance. The you know the the cost of just making sure the platform works. But it does seem odd that 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 they would do that. And they certainly I wouldn't imagine they do it long term. Yeah. All right, folks. Uh, if you know why Pink Tata does that, join in our conversation. <laughs> I I think we're 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 reserving judgment on Pink Tata. I like that idea a lot. Oh, yeah. Ex except yeah. for that one little niggling thing there. What yeah, I like just, the best it, is how you first named like, it. Yeah. Pink Tada. Like, Ta yeah. Yeah. Pink Tada. Just yeah. Just explain more about the sustainable <laughs> model of yours, where nobody loses by getting the NFT. Yeah. I like just like in a real marketplace stuff. where no one ever loses. I think the idea is like, look, you're going to be able to resell it for more than you reserved it for because these places will be in demand. And I don't know if that's true. Yeah. yeah. Uh, anyway, join in the conversation on our Discord. Uh, you can talk about this or anything else uh, by linking to a Patreon account at patreon.com slash DTNS. It's no secret that there's a huge gap between cybersecurity jobs and available people to fill those jobs. According to the International Information System Security Certification Consortium, there's about 400,000 open security jobs in the U.S. alone, even after the U.S. job market added 250,000 people to the Internet and cybersecurity workforce between 2020 and 2021. So, Dave, we got the demand. We got the supply. Why isn't there a rush of job applicants in the space? So this has been a chronic issue, uh, and I will say that you hear complaints about this on Reddit, on LinkedIn, on Twitter. I would say most predominantly I see it on Reddit, um, where people green to the industry, desperate to get in because they hear about all these positions that are open. But the problem is all these positions are open are for people with, you know, three to five plus years of experience, sometimes even more. There is little to no demand, sadly, for uh, entry-level people. But companies are realizing this is the problem. And so what they're doing is they are starting to slowly, not quickly, but slowly open up entry-level positions and built into that provide some level of training. But unfortunately, not all companies can do this. Yeah. So you've got IBM, uh, which which I saw is adding train, training centers at six HBCUs, uh, Xavier University of Louisiana, the Southern University System, North Carolina A&T, South Carolina State, Clark Atlanta, Morgan State. Uh, these are IBM saying we want to train people to work at IBM, but not everybody's IBM. So if you can't go sponsor training centers, uh, what do you do? Well, 
let me though let me get to that question but i do want to answer the fact that they're doing this specifically for the african american community because this this community for so long was underserved mostly because they didn't aware that cybersecurity was even an option for them uh Jarek Beeson who's the CISO over uh, uh CISO Commercial Bank for uh, Capital One who is African American himself he said in his community you only realized it because either a relative went into cybersecurity or you yourself or relative was in the military specifically there was no way to discover that even cybersecurity was even a job option at the time. So that's kind of key for the African-American community right there. But to answer your question, if you don't have this capability specifically uh, to do the training programs, individuals, what they really need to do is they need to approach cybersecurity leaders directly, which can be quite daunting uh, to do just that. But they are pretty welcoming, and I, I would highly recommend the way the best way to approach them is in social media. If the cybersecurity leader you are interested in working with is prolific in social media, comment on their posts, and then after you know a while of commenting, they will kind of get to know your name and feel free to try to reach out to them directly. Predominantly, I will tell you, LinkedIn is a great spot to do this. Uh, Twitter is also a big space as well. Those are kind of the two predominant spaces where you will find cybersecurity leaders. Well, that that sounds like a good idea for somebody who wants a job in cybersecurity. But what about the company who says, I need experienced people. I oh. can't I can't go train them up. I'm not IBM. Well, I can't create a center so, that's going to so put them in my pipeline. Party, there are third-party companies that will do training, but it's, and they will, you know, they'll budget that into, you know, their budget for hiring young staff to also train them up. But there's, there's external training and then there's training within the company. And so what usually companies need to do in that situation is they need to set aside time for their own staff, their senior staff, to be able to train the younger green staff. If you have all your senior staff maxed out with no time for training, you just are incapable of bringing people on and bringing green people on. And so what results is you could only hire more senior people. And that's an extraordinarily competitive market that is just getting more and more costly. So, you know, I haven't run the numbers, but you have to look for yourself and goes, what is cheaper for us and what is more cost efficient? Uh, and also how quickly can we get them on board? Because you may spend six months trying to find that senior level person when you could have trained somebody up to learn a certain portion of what that senior person could do. And you could get a green person on, you know, right away. Actually. Yeah. And if you're never bringing in new people, then you're not creating, you know, the next generation. You, you need to bring exactly. on, bring on new folks, keep them happy, keep them growing, keep them trained, ongoing training, uh, expanding their, their, their horizons, uh, in, in this industry. Uh, and, and, you know, you're, you're, you're going to be cutting off your supply if you don't do that. Cause from what you've, you've said, it, it seems like there's no shortage of people who want these jobs. It's it's it's, it's on the, the shortage of the senior people to figure out how to bring the new folks into the system, so to speak. And let me just also add: if you are only dealing with senior level people, it's going to be extraordinarily costly for you mm -hmm. because it's such a hyper competitive market, and people are being torn away from one job to the next purely through money. Uh, and, and other opportunities. And the fact that most cybersecurity companies, or I'm not going to say most, many cybersecurity companies now are hiring virtually that, you know, that person doesn't need to be physically local to be torn away. Yeah. Now, on the other end, I get where companies are like, sure, but it's security, which is more important than ever. I need to make sure I'm hiring people who can do the job can and do the job well, right? Right. And, and, and you can do that at the green levels, but it's the thing is there's a risk to bringing someone on green. You don't want them to have, you know, admin access to core servers right away. Yep. So you have to actually do risk management with green people. How do you bring them on? How do you train them and learn to trust them? So they, and they trust you as well as you are slowly giving them tools and giving them access. So this, it's a very, very delicate balance at all different levels. Yeah, it seems like there's not an easy answer here. But if if there's someone out there uh, who's looking to break into security, whether they're they're young and right out of college or, or there's somebody that's taking advantage of this training to, to change careers, do you have any advice to, to help them break in? 
So the big advice is, and I see someone ask, you know, what about the CompTIA Security Plus uh, certificate? Certificates are not going to get you in. One of the, the key things is, I would highly recommend is get involved in communities. I can't stress that enough. That is the one thing. Everyone has a local community of some sort. If you don't have one, start one. I'm starting one here in the San Diego area. There are others in the San Diego area as well. But it's really, really important to get involved in your local communities of cybersecurity. You will learn about who is hiring. And I'm telling you, on our shows, every time I have a guest on, I always ask, are you hiring? And 95% of the time, they're hiring. So if you ask a security leader, are you hiring? Chances are pretty high that they are. Yeah. And then Lawn Makes uh, says they got a gig that'll pay for a CompTIA cert. So, you know, if you get the job, well, you a might lot be of able people, to get an investment, or at least it'd be smart for a company to make that investment, maybe. I will tell you, a cert alone will not get you a job. It just no, but I'm saying won't. once you get the job, if the company's smart, they'll invest in those certificates. And they will invest, yes. Yeah. And, and sometimes they do that. But like the CISSP, that's a, you know, that is one that often some companies require if you want to move into security leadership roles. Yeah. All right. From security, now that we've got you all jobs, uh, to detecting earthquakes. Yeah. So in the journal Science, researchers have published how they used a 3,600-mile th uh, cable, fiber optic cable, between Halifax, Canada, and Southport in the United Kingdom, pretty long cable, to mm -hmm. detect storms and tides, even earthquakes. So the cable lies on the seafloor. It's tiny. The, the tiny but measurable disturbances in those fiber optics affect the light speeds across the Atlantic Ocean. That's the ocean we're going around and give a reading of the location of perhaps a quake. Maybe it's a big one. Maybe it's a small one or some other disturbance. The researchers used a form of infer interferometric, I knew I was going to get that wrong, sensing, which exploits a device in undersea cables called a repeater. So if there's no uh, perturbation, the signal stays stable. But if there's been a disturbance, even a small one, that frequency changes, and then they have more information on what has happened. I love this. It's a hack. It's basically saying we already have this information, right? We just needed to. Well, and you it. don't have to go out to sea yeah. to like be on top of it and be in a storm <laughs> or anything. It's just yeah. you. You have a lot more information the about North what's Atlantic, going on. Not a peaceful place to be at sea. Not, really. not getting those looking glass waters in the North Atlantic. So yeah, yeah, this is yeah good. it's pretty cool. All right, let's check out the mailbag. So Mike wrote in and said, this is in response to our conversation yesterday about Amazon, maybe doing deliveries from shopping malls. What are we doing here? Mike said, in the coverage of Amazon using those local malls as delivery points, I heard the conversation focused around Amazon delivering from businesses at the mall. Mm -hmm. I think the bigger move here is Amazon getting into that one hour or same day delivery. To achieve this, they need warehouses closer to people. In the Phoenix area, where Mike lives, he says there's a big Amazon distribution point on the far side of town from me, but right down the street, there's a mostly vacant mall along with plenty of other vacant commercial real estate. The mall's being redeveloped right now, and Amazon is putting in a big old Whole Foods. Mm. I have to believe there'll be a bunch of other space for storing products that people in neighboring zip codes order regularly or want immediately. Mike says, I think leveraging that vacant mall real estate that Amazon may have partly caused is a big win in their push to shorter delivery times. That's a very good point, Mike. And I don't know if it's related to them doing the delivery from mall stores or not. It may or may not be. Uh, but nonetheless, even, even if it wasn't, uh, the idea of taking that vacant mall space and turning it into warehouses is one I've seen other people speculating that Amazon wants to do. Putting a Whole Foods in a place when you're going to rent out the rest of the space for the warehouse makes perfect sense. To me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yep. Smart. Well, thank you to you, David Spark, for bringing the knowledge today. Let folks know where they can keep up with all that you do. Uh, just check out CISOseries.com. If you are in cybersecurity or you are looking to get into cybersecurity. We have a ton of fun shows. We have five shows on the network. Our newest one is that blue icon at the top, Capture the CISO. It's kind of like a shark tank, but for security vendors. And then lastly, the one in the middle, Super Cyber Friday is a live show. We do most Fridays, not this Friday because of the holiday weekend, but click on that and you can register for our future Super Cyber Friday events. I'll tell you the cybersecurity community is a lot of fun and really funny too. And uh, it's a, just a great group to engage with, kind of like your audience as well. Oh, thanks. 
We also want to extend a special thanks to Damien Mares, who's one of our top lifetime supporters for DTNS. We love to give you a little congrats for being with us all these years. So, Damien, thank you. Also, a reminder, there's a longer version of the show called Good Day Internet. We talk about all the things, all the things. Sometimes it's tech, sometimes it's food, sometimes it's both. <laughs> it's available at patreon.com slash DTNS. Reminder, we are live Monday through Friday. If you'd like to join us live, please do so. 4 p.m. Eastern, 20 hundred UTC. Find out more at dailytechnewsshow.com slash live. We are back tomorrow with Scott Johnson. Talk to you then. This show is part of the Frog Pants Network. Get more at frogpants.com. Diamond Club hopes you have enjoyed this program. <laughs>